Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Training, Learning, and Development Communities Accessible and Inclusive Design Conference. Let's see. Happy Thursday to all that are out there. It's, I'm just checking to see, make sure that folks in the room are coming in. Yep, I just saw Jeremy's photo pass by. And if you can, please post in chat where you are, where you might be uh, logging in from, just so I make sure the uh, that we have some interaction with the audience and also just for fun. So let's take a look there. Now, I'm, uh, I want to make just a couple announcements about today in particular before we get started, before, I let, um, before Kayleen takes over. But uh, today is a little bit of a different schedule than originally planned. Um, we had a cancellation with a couple speakers from Elsie. It was Elizabeth and Stacy um, had a family emergency, and so they had to had to leave. And um, we're I hopefully we'll be rescheduling their their session for later on. It was about VILT, uh, but we did. Uh, add a couple more speakers for the event, which is absolutely, I mean, it's incredible. And one of them is going to be at 11 o'clock today, which is after this session. Now, usually there would be a 10 o'clock one, but we're going to have like a three hour break, but it's Dustin Gianelli from Why Here's Dustin. And um, Dustin is going to be talking about being prof profoundly deaf. And he is actually like, he's in the speaker bureau. He's definitely uh, uh, going to be a uh, a great session to, to be a part of. So at 11 o'clock, which isn't a typical time block, make sure you log in for that. And then tomorrow, kind of our closing keynote is going to be uh, Jessica Michaels, who is currently an Adobe Learning Partner. And uh, she'll be talking tomorrow about learning, um, about neurodiversity and L&D. Um, so I'll have more information about that. I don't have it on the website yet, but that's coming. And uh, I'm so grateful that uh, that Cindy Nagel has helped uh, bring those folks in. So very, very high quality sessions still ahead, as well as what we have next for all of you. Um, I'm looking at this panel of just beautiful people, and I'm so excited. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hide myself and let Kayleen take over. And thank you, Kayleen, and we'll see you soon. <laughs> thank you, Louise. And um, big shout out to, to Cindy Nagel, because she is amazing. She does all sorts of things behind the scenes to to make these events happen. So hello everyone and welcome to our panel, um, Nothing Without Us, Improving Inclusion of People with Disabilities. And before we get started, I have to give props to Meryl Evans for part of the title because as you, I'm sure you know, the mantra, Nothing About Us Without Us has been around for a very long time. I think it may have originated with Judy Human back in the disability civil rights movement. Um, I could be wrong, but it's been around for a while. Meryl has put her own spin on that and shortened it to nothing without us because, as she put it, people with disabilities belong in all conversations, um, no matter what is being discussed, even if it's not about people with disabilities, we belong at the table. So thank you, Meryl, for that. If you are not already following Meryl Evans on LinkedIn, I highly suggest that you do. She is a disability inclusion advocate and speaker who also happens to be deaf. And I think her name gets mentioned at every single one of these accessibility events because she is just amazing. So the way that we're going to do this, we're going to start out. This is going to be a very informal conversation um, with me and and um, these four lovely folks, my my good friends, Bella and Gwen and my future good friends, Puneet and Mary, whom I haven't had the joy of speaking with just yet, but that's going to change today. And then all of you in the chat as well. We want to we want to talk to you too. Um, I'm going to start by asking our panelists to introduce themselves, starting with a brief visual description for anyone who can't see us, whether that's because of a vision disability or because of a poor internet connection, whatever. Um, and then just a little bit about your professional background and whatever you feel comfortable with uh, sharing about your disabilities. So I'm going to start. My name is Kayleen, as, as um, Luis mentioned, and um, my pronouns are she, her. I am a white woman in my early 50s with shoulder length blonde hair, wearing a blue floral dress and blue glasses. I'm sitting in my office in front of floor to ceiling bookshelves that are teeming with books and, and decor. Maybe a little much for some folks, but I love it. <laughs> my professional background, I am an instructional designer. I'm the owner of Scissortail Creative Services, and we specialize in developing custom learning solutions really like working with purpose-driven organizations. 
who are doing something to make the world a better place. Before I got into instructional design way back in 20, or 2005, I was a teacher. So I've been in education since 1994. So long time. Um, as far as my disabilities, I have several, all of which are hidden or invisible. Some people prefer the term non-apparent. It doesn't matter to me what you call it, but um, basically it means that you wouldn't know from looking at me usually that I have any disabilities, but I have several. I'm not gonna go into all of them, but just kind of hit the highlights of the things that are the most de debilitating for me. And that the first one is that I have some sort of mast cell disorder yet to be named. My doctor did finally say, yes, it is a mast cell disorder. We just don't know which one. Mast cells are um, part of the immune system. They are involved in allergic responses. And mine are like, I don't know, the little chihuahuas that think they're a watchdog, you know, that they're like bark at everything. That's, that's my immune system right there. I'm just reactive to everything. And the trigger that gives me the most trouble is caffeine. I cannot, it's not that I can't have a cup of coffee in the morning. That's not, I'm not here to whine about that. Um, but I can't be around caffeine. So if you can imagine, it's really, really difficult to go about my daily life because anywhere I go, there's someone having coffee or a Dr. Pepper or iced tea or any of those really awesome drinks that I miss because I haven't always been allergic to caffeine. But um, I've got my, my herbal tea here because I am getting over a cough. So you'll see me sipping on that. But um, so the other thing, the other thing besides the airborne allergy to caffeine and a whole host of other things is I have something called prolonged concussion symptoms or persistent post-concussion syndrome from a head injury back in 2011. And what that means is I've had a near constant headache since 2011. Um, and I have debilitating migraines frequently. I have other cognitive symptoms from this um, and including really pretty bad memory issues. So I may swear to you that I've never seen a movie or I've never done something. And then you can say, oh no, we watched that together. Or, and I, I'm not trying to lie to you. I just don't remember. Um, so, so those, and then a couple of others that, um, so most of my disabilities happen later in life, but I didn't realize until the last year or two that I'm also autistic and that's the self-diagnosis, which the autistic community assures me is perfectly valid. And I'm just going to stick with that because I don't see the point in going per, for me personally, going to get the, the official diagnosis. But when I look back at my life, I can say, oh yeah, yeah, I've always been this way. Um, and then I also have dyscalculia, which is like dyslexia, but with numbers. So I'm not your numbers gal at all. So those are the, the highlights of mine. There's more but I'm gonna kick it over to Bela now to do the same thing, visual description, professional background, and anything that you feel comfortable sharing about your disabilities. And then I'll let you choose the next person to introduce themselves. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Kayleen. Hey everyone, um, Bella Gaitan. Uh, my pronouns are she, they. I have not figured out how to put them here on AirMeet, um, but I do need to do that. Uh, visual description by myself. I am a light-skinned Latina woman. I have very short, dark, curly hair. I'm wearing my Razor Kitty headphones um, with a mic. I have a black uh, dress on with like cream dots. Behind me is a soothing green wall, lots of plant babies and other little figurines. Um, first of all, I want to say, Kayleen, I, for the moment that we're ever going to meet in person, I'm going to have to prepare myself caffeine wise for a couple of weeks. I'm going to have to like ramp down so that I can be around you, but I will do that for you. I want you to know. Um, yeah. So professionally, um, I'm what they call a multi-potentialite. I have many things I've always wanted to be when I grow up and I feel really fortunate that I'm in a place now where I get to be a lot of those different things. Um, I've counseled uh, for the Trevor Project in the past. I've worked as a manager in a medical billing facility. I've worked in human resources. Um, I've worked in uh, caretaking for folks as well, but currently I am a technical instructional designer. That was my last role. Um, 
also, I do uh, DEIA, which is diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility work uh, for NASA and other companies. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think what else with me. I think that's pretty much it professionally. Um, in terms of disabilities, I always joke that, um, first of all, that I hit the diversity bingo when folks like meet me because it's like, check, check, check. You know, you get to check off almost everything on the card. Um, I have multiple rare uh, genetic and degenerative progressive diseases. Um, I was not diagnosed with any of them until I was in my early to mid 40s. I'm 47 now. Uh, the main jerk that causes me the most problems in my body would be Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Uh, it is a genetic condition where your collagen and connective tissue is, uh, think of it as too loose, right? It's not strong enough. If you think about a rubber band, I usually have one near me, and you stretch it, right? It, it'll go right back. If you stretch it like that and let go, someone watch out, right? But if you keep stretching that, stretching it, stretching it, stretching it, like what happens to that rubber band? It starts to get those little creases in it, right? And it just doesn't quite snap back as well. And at one point it's going to break because it's just going to wear down. So while my connective tissue inside is not going to break, you have to imagine that for 47 years now, every movement I've ever made, it goes too far. Okay. So we talk about like hypermobility. I'm going to show you what we joke as the Ehlers-Danlos gang sign would be this. Please don't try that. Um, I only show that to to kind of illustrate that every time I push a button, my finger will hyperextend. If I'm turning my signal in my car, my turn signal, I'll hyperextend. So I've had to learn over the years, now that I have severe arthritis in pretty much every joint in my body, I've had to learn how to do things differently. When I turn my signal, I have to do like this so that I know that I'm not going to hyperextend. Um, and the reason that I say that that is the biggest jerk in terms of like all my conditions is because a lot of the other conditions I have, they are quite often found with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Um, so I have dysautonomia. I have one of the, it's not a rare form, but it's one of the rarer forms called hyperadrenergic postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. I have to think of all those letters in my head which basically means my body is in fight or flight all the time. Um, I can drink water and my body will be like, oh crap, we're in crisis. And I'll start sweating. And there's no triggers um, except for heat is one of them. So you'll see me occasionally, you know, doing like this because I do sweat a lot. Um, but that kind of affects all the different automatic things in my body, breathing, temperature regulation, heartbeat. Uh, it's just all kind of haywire. OK, um, I'll just quickly run through because I don't want to take up too much time here. But I also have uh, spina bifida occulta. I have tethered cord syndrome. I've had to have my spinal cord detethered. Um, I have an ultra rare disease called Bichette's disease, uh, which is an autoimmune form of vasculitis. Uh, I have multiple brain lesions. I have ADHD. I also have borderline personality disorder. I try to talk a lot about that because of the awful stigma around personality disorders. Um, and so I try to talk about that often. Uh, I'm likely autistic. I'm self-diagnosed as well. I, like Kayleen said, it's, it doesn't make any difference for me to go get a, a formal diagnosis. Um, yeah. And I have much more. I, I just I have such a long list of 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 you know uh, disorders, diseases, conditions, syndromes that I can't remember them if they're on paper. Um, so I am going to pass it over to my dearest Mary. Thank you, Bella. Hi, everyone. My name is Mary Fashik. My pronouns are she, her. I am a North African, West Asian, Lebanese-born woman with white brown skin, short dark curly hair, wearing dark glasses, headphones, speaking into a microphone. I have a brand new coral top that I'm wearing. I got for my birthday this week. Um, 
I saved it for today, and I'm coming to you from my home office, which has cream cover walls and Marilyn Monroe art on the walls, because I love Marilyn. Um, I want to say before I go on to my um, some of my professional background, the reason why I give my visual description of what I do is so often part of my identity is erased or ignored. The fact that Lebanon and many of the other countries that I come from are in Asia is ignored. I am Asian, although I don't look what is perceived to be Asian, where I come from is West Asia. So it is important for me to identify that way and have my whole identity on it. Um, I've been a little bit of everything in my 46 years on this earth. I tutored for a long time. I was a private tutor. Um, and in 2019, I founded the Disability Rights Movement Upgrade Accessibility, because as we all know, accessibility in this world needs an upgrade. Um, I am a DEIA consultant, like Bella is. I've done it for, I'm doing it for NASA, I've done it for nonprofit organizations. I did it for my publisher as well. We overhaul all of their language and their structure in the organization. So I've done a little bit of everything. Um, I just left a position as community engagement manager, and I will be starting a new position as marketing consultant um, on Monday. So I'm very excited about that. Um, I have cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy is often a lack of oxygen to the brain at birth. Um, I'm adopted. I'm a transnational transracial adoptee. So I don't know a lot or anything surrounding my birth. Um, but I have what is considered that middle realm of cerebral palsy where it's not mild, but it's not severe either. But it's enough that people assume, A, that I have diminished capacity because of my speech, or B, that I've had a stroke because I can't possibly be disabled and be so intelligent. Um, and I am an ambulatory wheelchair user, but because of the lack of research in adults with cerebral palsy, you're not told that by the time you hit 40, let alone in your mid-40s, if you're ambulatory, that is going to significantly decrease every year you get older. So I'm a lot less ambulatory than I was a year ago, and a lot less ambulatory than I was five years ago. Um, I also, at the age of 40, was diagnosed with a list of chronic illnesses that was after my doctors telling me I was just getting older or I was just depressed and they were ignoring all of my symptoms. I have lupus, I have fibromyalgia, I have chronic fatigue, I also have hypermobile illness general syndrome. And the irony in that is that people say you can't have cerebral palsy, which makes you spastic and have hypermobility. But I'm here to tell you that you can have both. And the only reason why my hypermobility is not worse, worse is because of my spastic. So it, it could be a lot worse, but ironically, one of my disabilities is keeping my other one from working. 
um, that she survived from being disabled and chronically ill. Um, I'm often, often my chronic illnesses are ignored because of my cerebral problem. Because everyone wants to chalk everything up to my cerebral problem. And it's not all my cerebral problem. And we need more research in adults. And when I say adults, I don't mean 21 year olds. I mean 45 year olds. We need more research. I need to know what's gonna happen to me at the age of 60, 65, and 70. Um, and I could go on, but I'm gonna end there and I'll pass it over to Puneet. Thank you, uh, Marie. Uh, I, I think it's um, uh, always uh, a, a, a pleasure to hear from 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 both of you. Uh, my my name is Puneet. I come from D Delhi, India, and uh, the, my pronouns are he and him. And to talk about visual description, I'm a uh, South Asian brown man with uh, black hair, mustache. Uh, I'm I'm wearing a uh, black blackish brownish uh, check shirt and i'm sitting on a black chair uh, and uh, in my background i have uh, off white uh, walls and uh, i i'm a person with uh, dyslexia uh, dyspraxia and uh, and stammering and uh, only like last year i i realized that uh, my stammering was part of my dys dyspraxia so uh, 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 when you have dys dyspraxia, you have uh, uh, um, uh, issues with your with your movement. Like uh, it can be uh, the, the way you walk. It can be how uh, uh, you use your tongue, how you use your speech. Like all of these things are affected uh, when you have uh, dyspraxia. And talking about my professional uh, life, I'm trying to be an advocate for. Uh, people with disabilities especially uh, the youngsters that come from uh, from from the slums of the the global south and right now i'm exploring the intersection of climate change and uh, youngsters with disability uh, especially uh, uh, coming from a low income co communities in the in the south asia part uh, mainly i'm trying to explore india pakistan uh, nepal bangladesh sri lanka and uh, uh, I do not have uh, an option to nominate, but I, I would nominate Gwen if I'm pronouncing your name well. <laughs> Thank you, Puneet. Aloha, everybody. My name is Gwen Navrick Klaprik. I am a Filipino woman with black hair, short black hair, and I'm wearing red glasses, and I have a blue dress on, and you are not seeing the mess behind me because I have a wall divider right there, which happens to be like a Japanese um, motif with cherry blossoms, which I love. I am, um, I have been in many different industries over the course of my career. I have been in training and development or talent development in some capacity for the last 20 years. Um, my expertise is in performance improvement as well as in training, delivery, and facilitation. And currently I own my own company, um, which is a long name, so I won't go into it. But um, my disabilities are uh, things that I have had later, I was diagnosed with later on in life. Um, I have major depression, which is, can be very, very debilitating um, on occasion. It also contributes to a lot of my chronic illnesses like migraines, and um, I also have ADHD, so I have a squirrel brain. Full disclosure, I have not taken my medication yet because it is 5.30 in the morning here. So if my squirrel brain goes off, that's what you can, that's what you can attribute it to. But I also have chronic illnesses. I am a cancer survivor um, and um, just many other things. So I'm happy to be here and I'm going to turn things back over to Kayleen. Thanks so much, Gwen, and all of our panelists. Now I'm hearing an echo for some reason. I don't know why. All right. Um, seems to go away now. Now let me know in the chat if you're still hearing echoes or weirdnesses. Um, I love hearing all of your stories. Um, I would love to just talk for hours. Uh, but right now, 
what I'd like to ask is if you have ever been excluded from or unable to access a learning opportunity because of your disability. Um, let's see if there's someone who wants to start, wants to answer that. Okay, Mary. Um, when I got this question, I knew exactly how I was going to answer this question. Um, I graduated high school in the mid nineties and I've always wanted to teach. That was my passion. From the time I was very young, I always wanted to be a teacher. And the woman who adopted me wanted me to be a certified public accountant because I was good with numbers. i all I am the numbers person. I did I prepared income taxes for years later on in life, but I've always been the numbers person. And the woman who woke up with me was like, no, you're disabled, you're gonna need a lot of money. You're gonna need to make a lot of money. So you should go into accounting and you like numbers so it will be easy for you. Spoiler, it was not easy. Um, I took two years of accounting. I hated it in college. I was miserable. I wasn't good at it. I wanted to teach. So I decided to go speak to the Dean of Education because I wanted to minor in education. I thought, okay, maybe I can teach math or something. I I just wanted to teach. Um, I will say that at the time I was attending a private Catholic university in Miami and I was on a full four year scholarship there. Um, and it's, it was not easy to get into that university. And I go to speak to the Dean of Education, who happens to be a nun. Now, I am a recovering Catholic. At the time, I was a practicing Catholic. So when I go to speak to the Dean of Education, I tell her, well, I would like to minor in education. And she very abruptly tells me, well, there's no minor in education. I said, okay, I'll double major. I want to, I'll be double maker. I don't care to see what I want to do. And she looked at me and she said, you want to be a teacher? How about you going to teach? And I just kind of looked at her because I wasn't sure what she meant by how was I going to teach? I was already um, volunteering and tutoring at um, an elementary school a couple blocks away from the university. We would walk there twice a week and we would tutor. So I was already teaching, if you will. And she was insistent. She's like, who's going to write on the board for you? Well, at the time, this was the 90s, we had overhead projectors. And I said, well, I can write myself for the overhead projector, no one needs to write on the board for me. And she was like, no, you'll never be a teacher, you can't teach. And I just think about that that is something that I always wanted to do that I never got to do. I did wear on teach Sunday school for over 10 years because that was my way of being a teacher because I couldn't be a quote unquote real teacher. And that's also how I got into tutoring as well, um, full time. But, you know, I think about what my life would have been had I could have had the opportunity to get my degree in education. And it's just, you know, the fact that this was a nun, if this was a nun telling me this, what would someone outside of Bukorgi 
have told me about being a teacher. So, again, when I got this question, I can be with what I thought of. Yeah, that's a powerful story, Mary. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm so sorry that that happened. Um, I posted in the chat that Judy Human has a similar story that she wrote about in her memoir, Being Human, of, you know, being told, no, you can't do this, and which is ridiculous. You know, none of us should be deciding what another person can or can't do. It's not our call. Um, so same question, anyone else? Uh, you have experiences of being excluded from or unable to access a learning opportunity because of your disabilities. I can speak on mine because mine's really quickly. Um, oh, I'm hearing something in the background. Okay, there it went away. Um, I, I also have ADHD. So if I start like hearing something, I might be, I have the squirrel brain as well. Um, I think the biggest hindrances for me in terms of learning or education um, have to do with my ADHD, first of all. Um, as a child, every single report card was like, she's bright, but she won't stop talking. Or, you know, it was like, we've had, like, they, the teacher would have to move me like five, six, seven times a year. And they would try to, first of all, put me next to people they knew I wasn't friends with thinking, uh, oh, she's not going to talk. I would, then they'd move me next to boys thinking, you know, that standard thinking of, oh, the girl's not going to talk to the boy. No, I'd still talk and, and carry on. Um, so that was always an issue in education, just being able to stay focused and stay engaged with learning. Um, the other way that I am excluded on almost a daily basis is I'm colorblind. I'm red, green, colorblind. And a lot of folks don't think that because one of the things that people tell me a lot of times is, whoa, Bella, like, the first thing I think of when I see you are bright and bold colors. Like, look at your website. Look at the, you know, the, the graphics that you produce and stuff. And I think a lot of folks don't realize that colorblindness is on a spectrum. And what I mean by that is it affects folks differently. I'm colorblind, which is pretty rare for a, a someone born female. Um, my son is colorblind. My dad is colorblind but you can put the same colors in front of us and we all have the same kind of color blindness, obviously, but we'll see different colors. Whereas I may say, okay, I think that's purple. My son might be like, no, that's blue. And my dad might be like, that's like blue green or like a, you know, reddish, you know, something. Um, and so it's one of the reasons that I'm so passionate about image descriptions because a lot of folks will stop with alt text. And so for those who don't know, alt text is the uh, the information that you put about a picture that you kind of embed within the picture, right? So someone using a screen reader, when they're going through a site, they would hear something like a picture of, you know, Kayleen, Puneet, Mary, Gwen, and Bella on a screen, right? But they don't know anything else about the photo from that. It's just that basic, you know, what it is, just so they know... I'm losing my words now, so I'm gonna move on. Um, image description is for folks like myself who might need to understand what are the colors in that chart, right? Because I've been in situations where people are using red and green for stop and go or good and bad or do this and don't do that without any additional you know, words to signify to someone like myself who can't see the difference maybe between those colors. Um, even in work situations, I've had to constantly speak up when we're in meetings and I'm just like, uh, do y'all have any plans to make this, uh, this presentation accessible? And crickets. Or people will say, well, you know, why don't you let us know exactly what needs to be changed? The onus should not be on me to go around and teach everyone how to be accessible, right? Um, and that's something that I think we talked about, I'm trying to think, was that in the session on Monday, perhaps? Um, I think it was at the table. Wes Dean, I think, was talking about it. Um, also, y'all, Wes Dean, like, follow Wes Dean. Uh, Wes Dean's in chat, pretty active. Um, they have some amazing gems. And they're teaching a disability course coming up soon, a history of disability course. So, yeah. Uh, 
but yeah, I'll, I'll be quiet now, but yeah, most of what I've had to go through has had to do with like my neurodivergence and my color blindness. Thanks so much, Bella. I know you had posted something about a, a course that you signed up for paid money for that wasn't accessible to you because of the, I think because of the color blindness issue, right? Yeah, it was actually like a professional. So I'm really big into like herbalism, Ayurveda um, and stuff like that. And so I purchased a program to, you know, learn more about it. And each herb, each food, you know, that they were presenting, the only way that they were labeling them were these tiny, tiny, tiny little icons. And they were just a color with like a letter in it. And I couldn't, I couldn't see them. And they didn't have alt text, so I couldn't right click on them or use one of my uh, Chrome extensions I use to see alt text because I don't use a screen reader. So I was having to go through so much extra effort just to try to figure out what that image was. Um, and it was just, it, it, it was awful. It was absolutely awful. And that would have been such an easy thing to fix in the design if people were thinking about people with disabilities when they design. And that's the whole whole point of this conversation is we want folks thinking about inclusion of all sorts of people, including people with disabilities. Um, I will share, I've been excluded from lots of, lots of learning experiences because of my disabilities. Um, I can't go to any in-person learning events. So things like, you know, DevLearn, whenever DevLearn comes up every year, people are so excited about it. And I'm over here going, well, I'll never get to go to that. Um, and yeah, there are a few um, virtual sessions for it now, I think, but not very much. And um, the people who are planning conferences in particular need to consider making more hybrid events available, but also consider um, the value that they're providing because they might, some of them charge the same amount for attending virtually as they do in person. And it is just really not the same value because you don't get all those, you know, um, organic conversations that come up from just meeting folks in the hall or whatever. You also, you know, you don't get the dinners and all of that stuff that, that often are included in conference fees. But other than that, um, even before I developed the allergy to caffeine in particular and could go to in-person training with some modifications, because I have other allergies too, like chocolate is one of them. Um, and yes, chocolate has caffeine in it, but I'm, I was allergic to chocolate before I was allergic to all caffeine. Um, and so that bananas, some other things. So, you know, we had to communicate to, to the training folks. So, okay, we can't have this, 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 this in the room. And it's really hard to enforce that because people bring their own snacks. And so, yeah, that's difficult. But other things like, for instance, because of the, the migraines, the, the um, head injury stuff, just about every classroom has got those awful fluorescent lights. And for many of us, um, and I didn't figure it out until later that it's kind of a double whammy concussion plus the uh, autism, that the fluorescent lights are really, really a bad trigger for me. So if we can just, you know, dim some lights or something, especially if you're looking up at a screen and there are overhead lights in your field of vision when you're looking at that screen, that's really, really um tiring for our eyes and our brains too, because one of the things about us autistic folks is we have a hard time filtering out extraneous in, input stimulus. So the fewer distractions, the, the, you know, the dimmer lights you can have, things like that, that's always really, really helpful. I'm sure I could think of other examples. Um, oh, I will think, I will say one more that's not an in-person thing, but like virtual meetings and even e-learning movement on the screen. If we can't stop movement that's on the screen, it's super distracting to being able to learn as well as for some of us, it triggers vertigo issues. Like I can get basically seasick from watching movement on a screen. Um, 
so if your website has some sort of video playing in the background and I'm spoke I'm trying to read text that's over that and no can't do that if any learning course has any sort of motion that I can't stop especially if I'm trying to read something on the same page that's just that's exclusionary really like I cannot learn from that um, same thing with background music when someone is talking I can't filter that out so if you make an explainer video and you've got background music going through the whole thing while you've got the narration you're excluding learners right there because some of us cannot handle both of those inputs at the same time and if you look into to Mayer's principles um, really that's not a good thing to do anyway you know you're having multiple inputs going to the same sensory mode it's just not good for learning so anyway anyone else have stories or examples they want to share about inaccessibility in learning that you've experienced Yeah, yes. So uh, thank you so much Bella, for explaining the that why we need a uh, email description because actually I was thinking about it uh, only uh, yesterday. And uh, so I always used to write uh, all text and 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 I, 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 I image description in, in my post, but I never knew the reason behind it. So that was really interesting for me to for, for me to know. And also like uh, it is also like about uh, having a uh, having a uh, thought process where uh, we always know that this is the right thing to do even sometimes we don't know the reason but uh, the best practices are sometimes you just have to uh, copy them uh, because you know i'm very new to uh, very new to the space and i don't know uh, what are the challenges that uh, people with different disabilities other than me face and that is uh, the uh, i would say uh, a secret behind uh, how to be accessible is to always be mindful of what other people go through is to you know listen and not and not uh, being afraid of making mistakes uh, and uh, this is what like uh, is always like on my uh, on on my radar that you know that don't even if i am posting everything i make sure that i'm making mistakes if someone is pointing me out through their comment through their personal messages it's always i'm always like very welcoming to that person people who use Kuni, your your audio uh, is cutting out for us. Could not hear the last uh, now, um, little bit that you said. Yeah. Yeah, so is it, is it better now? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I was saying that uh, using too much of emojis and uh, bold text can be tricky as well. Uh, so all of like uh, being mindful of, of, uh, of different challenges people face can be really uh, an issue. And uh, when I talk about uh, what challenges uh, I face, so I think uh, the biggest challenge would be to ask. You know, uh, because I don't know like how the other person, how the instructor, how the teacher, how, uh, uh, you know, the trainer would react to my request. And especially like uh, a, a person like me who is coming from a background, uh, who is coming from uh, a background of domestic violence, uh, that that person like would feel like a lot of, uh, you know, always like already uh, that person is thinking that uh, there is something wrong with my life you know why why it's happening to me all of these uh, challenges you know you're facing poverty as well when you're, when you're coming from from islam so asking for help is a very uh, tr tricky thing and 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 to have a very open dialogue within that space to create that that safe space is is is, is i would say uh, the most critical thing and uh, most of the places have been a failure in 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 this regard if, like in my experiences only uh, recently i, I have uh, uh, came through play, uh, through people and organizations that are very open that are like uh, accepting their mistakes and you know uh, learning from them and uh, and that comes from both of these sides because i have uh, uh, i know some people who are just 
you know bullying uh, people who are not accessible so that is also not the right way like we should know how to have a two way dialogue where we are not bullying people like uh, yes if, if if they want to learn like they they will learn but it's 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 always good to be polite and you know uh, uh, love and uh, kindness will like will always be the best thing when it comes to communication oh absolutely love and kindness yes um any sort of accessibility discussion or inclusion has to start with empathy like we need to understand where other folks are coming from and and attempt to understand and also believe what people are telling you. I cannot tell you how many times I've had the experience and I've heard other people with disabilities have the experience of people not believing us. People think we are making things up for attention or whatever else. I don't I don't know what the motivation would be um, for me to tell people, y'all, I can't be around coffee or I can't be around chocolate. Like why I'm just a sadistic person who wants you to not enjoy chocolate, which is one of the best things on the planet. Like, no, I'm, it's not, I'm not making it up. I'm just trying to protect my health and my life, you know, and, and people with disabilities, you know, what, whatever it is, when they ask for an accommodation, understand that sometimes even just making that request, there's a lot of fear behind it. There's a lot of, you know, trepidation because because we experience discrimination. Um, we experience the people asking us all sorts of questions or accusing us or whatever else. Um, and, and like Bella said, you know, all of the onus cannot be on us. If obviously you're probably not going to anticipate that somebody in your class is allergic to caffeine, can't be around caffeine. That's a, that's kind of a rare one, a, an outlier, but you can anticipate that you probably have folks with vision disabilities, with hearing disabilities, with um, any all sorts of neurodivergence. You know, you've got these learners in your organization. You have these employees in your organization, whether you know it or not, because a lot of us don't self-identify. Don't don't check the box that says I have a disability, because if 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 it's not an apparent one, then we don't have to go through the kind of discrimination that Mary talked about when she talked about going to college, you know, we can, we can opt out of that because we have the privilege of other people not judging us so readily. Um, but I want to look at some of the things that are in the chat because folks have been posting all sorts of wonderful things in the chat. So I'm going to look at just a few of those comments. Abby shared, my partner has dyslexia and you know, the trauma surrounding learning and reading and people grow up with the stigma of thinking they aren't smart. That is so, so true. My husband has dyslexia and two of our daughters have dyslexia and um, our daughters were able to get kind of early intervention and, and some s skills to, to learn to read. My husband, who is 50, how old is he now? 57, 58, I don't remember. Um, <laughs> told you I have memory issues. Um, so, I mean, he was in elementary school a long, long time ago and no one, I don't, they probably knew that dyslexia existed, but he sure didn't know that he was dyslexic and he grew up with that stigma of just feeling stupid. Um, and we still feed into that stigma because I've heard people in my profession say things like, well, if they can't read the text on the screen, then they shouldn't be in this career. You know, they sh everybody knows how to read. Well, okay, sure. My husband knows how to read, but it's a struggle for him, especially if certain things, like if it's a wall of text, if it's not broken up very well, um, it just, it makes the process of learning so much harder when it's something that he has to read. Um, and just, being able to have someone read that to him is a really easy way to accommodate for that. All right. So there's other folks who are talking about the fluorescent lights being a problem. Um, Jenna mentioned something I've been looking into is the idea of trauma informed pedagogy and the medical trauma of all these impairments and disabilities that also add to the effort and energy that goes into learning. Um, and processing the information, that trauma, the cognitive and sometimes physical load can be debilitating. Yes, I, I would 
definitely agree with that. And I think that Puneet kind of spoke to that a little bit. Um, I can say for me, and going back to that conversation of putting the onus on disabled people to to ask for accommodations, yes, we we need to let folks know when we need accommodations. But for for most things, if you can make things accessible for by default, then we don't have to. If we just want to access a website, we don't have to email someone to ask, can I get this as an accessible version? Or, you know, I mean, we shouldn't have to make those requests. Um, but also some of those requests are difficult because of trauma we have experienced. Um, and I would say that the, you know, that trauma may be different for different people, different disabilities, different situations. Um, I also grew up in a, an environment with some domestic violence and um, just a lot of uncertainty. And one of the ways I adapted is became a people pleaser. Like I will do anything to smooth things over and not have conflict because I grew up in that environment where everything was a conflict and everything was like send me into panic mode. And so I am too quick to not advocate for myself about here's what I need because I don't want to put you out. I don't want to, you know, <laughs> impose on you. Oh, no, you like your coffee. I, well, I'll just, um, I got my EpiPen here. You know, no. And I'm not, I don't do that anymore, but I used to. I used to put myself at risk because I was afraid of speaking up. And so keep that in mind that, oh, trauma-informed practice is a really good idea. Okay, so I'm going to um, keep looking at the chat and turn it over to anybody else on our panel who has something to to say. Um, and if you, if nothing is speaking to coming to mind right now, the next question on our list was what would you like learning and development professionals to know about how we can be more inclusive? And we are coming up on the top of the hour. So we need to wrap this up anyway. Um, I can go for that. I, you know, I think that it's just awareness is a really big thing. I mean, for me, you know, for somebody who was diagnosed later on in life, it just never occurred to me. Um, and, you know, until it happens to you, until and I talked about this in my session on, on Monday, until somebody comes to you and says, this is exclusionary for me and I, it doesn't work for me as a trainer, as a facilitator, as a learning and development professional, you kind of, if you're not prepared for it, then it kind of takes you aba uh, back a bit. And so it's just being a little bit more aware of that disabilities a are out there b that people are not going to disclose to you what it is so the more you can anticipate um different types of needs out there then the more exclude the more inclusion um more inclusive you are so i can give an example you know i i speak at several conferences a year and one of the conferences that I spoke with, I spoke at last year, just happened to be a major safety conference. So my husband and I do a lot of safety training. And, you know, in that, you need people to understand what you are saying because they need to go home at the end of every day, right? So if they don't understand safety training, they can't go home or they may not go home. And so we we talk a lot about inclusion and safety training and, and adding accessibility and all these things. And we had a participant who came in and stopped dead in her tracks because we had the automatic um, subtitles on for PowerPoint. And she said, I'm going to cry. She said, I am hard of hearing. I have asked the conference organizers to help me with this. They have tried their best. This is the first and only session I have ever been in where I feel like I can now sit back and just absorb rather than trying to understand. And so it's stuff like that, that you never know when you are making a difference. You just need to be able to be aware of these are things that people might need and, you know, offer options if you can, because again, that can be just the subtitles of PowerPoint can be distracting to somebody who's neurodivergent. So in the chat, it talks about there's a lot of conversation about what's good for some people are, you know, distraction or not good for other people. So it's it's kind of a balance. And so I think giving people as many options as possible to be able to learn in the way that they need to be able to learn goes a long way. Awesome. Thank you for that, Gwen. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the Q&A that we'll try to get through quickly. 
Um, Gabrielle Gray asks, Kayleen, do white backgrounds on websites and e-learnings bother you the same way lights do? If so, is there a color that is better? Um, for me personally, because I do have a vision disorder as well uh, that affects how I see color. It's not color blindness. It's just that certain color contrasts are really difficult for me. Um, bright white with black is not ideal. And I think that's true for a lot of people. If you can tone down just a little bit like off white with black or really, really dark gray with white or things like that are easier on some of our eyes than others. Um, I am not one who has to have dark mode on everything. I actually prefer a lighter background because reading white text on a dark background is harder for me, but it's usually okay. Like this, this, um, the background on air meat right now is fine because it's not true black. It's not all the way black with all the way white. That's the biggest thing is just kind of mute those a little bit. And as far as colors, um, I've talked before about not using the really, really bright, you know, default colors in office, the red and the, the yellow that are just glaringly bright. Try to go in and, and move those colors a little toward the middle of the color wheel a little bit more to add some more gray to them. And that helps reduce eye strain. Megan says, someone mentioned that background music and video is distracting when a person is speaking. Would it help to significantly lower the sound of the music or is it better to remove it completely? Um, and then the rest of it, do you have any other, the comment is, I can't see the whole comment, but um, for me personally, it's better to not have the music at all. Cause even if it's very, very faint, it's, I can't tune it out. It's, it's like they're almost equally noisy in my brain. Um, I would rather have the option of being able to turn it off or just, just not have it. Like what I usually do in narrated videos is I might start with a little intro, a little stinger of music and then go into the narration without music and then have the little outro of music at the end. Um, and that, you know, you get your little music in there, but it's not throughout the whole thing. So anyone, any of our panelists have anything to add? There is a question in the chat, Kayleen, about making our advice of making videos accessible. Um, I'm not a video expert, but I do try to at least find um, a video that's got a transcript or closed captioning available and audio descriptions, which are not as distracting as people think they are. So if you if you just look it up on YouTube and you and, you know look for an audio a video with audio descriptions, if it's done well, it's actually seamless into the video and doesn't it's not distracting. So yeah, thank you for for taking that question, Gwen. Um, and yeah, I'm a big proponent of transcripts for everything. Even if you have closed caption transcripts, because transcripts are the, really the only way you can make things accessible for deaf blind people. And they also really help those of us with cognitive issues like memory problems, because it's harder to go back and scrub through a video to find content. It's easy to look through a transcript to find it. All right. Thank you so, so much to our panelists. I wish we could have talked longer. I really want to hear more from all of you. Um, but we'll have to save it for another day. You all were wonderful. And thank you to everyone in the chat too. Really, really awesome session. Thanks everybody. It was really enlightening. Um, I loved it. So, and Kayleen, thank you so much for organizing this panel and bringing everyone together. I so appreciate it. I have you. to say thank you to Bella because um, she brought in Mary and Puneet who were fabulous. So definitely True. thank you for that. True. And I want to thank Kayleen too. All these thanks. I want to thank Kayleen too for being, um, just so everyone knows, Kayleen is kind of one of the founders of AD, AIDC. Um, it was originally like three years ago when uh, when this idea came up. Kayleen was really formative in helping uh, build this event out. So kudos to, to you, Kayleen. Thank you so much. Just none of this would be happening if it wasn't for you. So appreciate you. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and close out the session. Everybody, um, just a reminder, Dustin Gianelli is going to be here at 11 a.m. Pacific time. I guess it's 2 p.m. Eastern. So please return for that. I think it's going to be a really fascinating session to be a part of. And so we hope to see you all there. Um, and that's it. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>